All right, everyone, welcome back to the land of chem. I am your host and the author. My name is Jeffrey Drum. Thank you all so much for joining me again. So before we get started on today's episode, I just want to say a quick personal thank you to all of the new viewers and subscribers here on the land of chem YouTube channel. Over the past week, this channel has basically blown up with several hundred extra subscribers. I have no idea where everyone is coming from, but thank you so much for finally making it here to the Land of Chem YouTube channel. It really, really means a lot to me and has been overwhelming in a positive sense for me to see all of the new subscribers and comments and feedback. Everything has been incredibly positive, very thankfully, and I've really been enjoying interacting with everyone in the comments section. So just remember, if you see a comment or reply to your comment from Jeffrey Drum, that is me replying from my personal page. So I just watch YouTube for my personal YouTube account as opposed to the Land of Chem channel account. So I usually tend to reply to all of the comments directly from my personal page. So just remember that if you see a comment from Jeffrey Drum, that is me getting back to you personally. And I really, really appreciate all the comments. It helps to get this material into the algorithm. And again, it's just really, really amazing for me to hear what you guys think. And there have been some great ideas and some great questions. And I'm going to be addressing all of that stuff in later videos. Yes, I have tons of material that's going to come up. Uh, it's just one thing at a time. And I'm doing the best I can to get all this out to you as soon as possible. So this is episode 13, The Land of Chem 2021 Research Expedition Recap, Part 1, covering the structures of Saqqara. So I just got back from Egypt about a week ago, and this was my third trip to the land of Chem. And I'm really, really excited to get all of this new research out to you as soon as possible. Um, I have tons and tons of new material, and it would have been a 10 hour long video if I tried to compress it all down into one. So we're going to do this in sections. So during this trip, we got a chance to visit numerous different sites in Egypt. We went to Saqqara and visited the Pyramid of Winis the Step Pyramid, the newly opened Southern quote unquote tomb, and of course the Serapium at Saqqara. And I'm gonna be discussing all of those structures in today's video. Our next stop was the Fayum Oasis to visit the pyramids of Hawara, Lahun, and my doom. And of course, at the Pyramid of Hawara, there is also the fantastic labyrinth of Hawara. And I'm gonna be diving into full detail regarding that expedition in the next video. So, of course, we also got a chance to go to Dashur to explore the Red and Bent Pyramids, which are two of my favorite sites to investigate when traveling to Egypt. We were very, very fortunate to be on the Giza Plateau for the fall equinox, and it was an absolutely amazing experience to participate in that on such an important day in the year. Um, very, very cool experience on the Giza Plateau, and again, I'm going to be presenting some exclusive photos and videos from all of these sites including sort of a recap of the chemical operations that were included at each one of those locations and presenting some new material, new research that will be coming up in my subsequent publications. So I've been very, very excited to get all this stuff together. Um, this is going to be part one covering Saqqara and then all of the rest of the videos from my research expedition will be coming out very, very soon. So thank you all so much again to all of the new subscribers. This video is for you guys to get this new content out there. Thank you all so much for watching and subscribing. And without further ado, let's get right to it. <laughs> and just a quick reminder that limited first edition print copies of the Land of Chem book are now available at thelandofchem.com. So if you've been enjoying watching these videos here on the Land of Chem YouTube channel and you want to help support the channel, just go to the website. You can pick up a shirt, pick up a copy of the book, whatever you'd like. It really, really means a lot to me. So thank you all so much in advance. All right, ladies and gentlemen, as we begin today's episode, I wanted to present this quote from the first chapter, the first degree of the land of Chem. So at the very beginning of the book, Brother Julius and Aquari travel from Ireland to Egypt so that Aquari can receive the degrees of the Egyptian pyramids and be initiated into the secrets of ancient chemistry. So they arrive into the harbor of Saqqara during the Akhet, which was the season of the annual Nile River flood. So it was summer in Egypt, the peak season of the Akhet, and the inundated waters of the Nile River had already reached the threshold of the temple. With the wind sweeping off the river to their backs, they began walking up a partially submerged pathway leading out from the water and into the impressive stone structure. And you can see here in this picture, which was taken before the construction of the High Aswan Dam, that even in the modern times, the water level from the flooded Nile River 
went all the way up to the threshold of the temple and almost reached the pyramids themselves. And this was also true in the ancient times. And you can see here in this depiction of the ancient harbor of Saqqara, this is a depiction of the Nile River during the season of the Shamu, which was the harvesting season. And this was the lowest water level of the Nile River throughout the year. So you can see here in this area, these are the farmlands that would have surrounded the Nile River. And during the flooding, this entire area would have been submerged with water, and the water level of the river would have come all the way up here to the threshold of the temple. And in this depiction, you can see here the Valley Temple at Saqqara and the harbor surrounding the temple. And I'm going to show you some exclusive pictures and videos of this area here in just a moment. But from the Valley Temple, you can see the causeway leading to the Pyramid of Winis, and you can see here on the right the Step Pyramid Complex of Saqqara. And of course, part of my theory is that the Egyptian pyramids were originally designed to work in conjunction with the Nile River flooding. So as the Nile began to flood, all of this farmland would have been submerged in water, the water would have reached the threshold of the temple, and the causeway and the underground conduit system was used to conduct the water from the flooded Nile River through this causeway system into the reservoirs surrounding these structures. And of course, that water was utilized within the pyramids to facilitate chemical reactions. And just a quick recap on the time frame used within the narrative of the land of Kambuk. So I've been very interested in researching the end of the last ice age circa 10,000 BC. And I do believe that there was a massive catastrophe that destroyed a huge civilization in North America. And the survivors of that catastrophe fled all across the world, bringing their knowledge of construction and chemistry to these new areas. So the time frame used in the book is approximately 7,000 BC when these inhabitants began to settle around the Nile River Valley. And you can see here that prior to 8500 BC, this upper eastern part of the Sahara was a complete desert and the population was centered directly around the Nile River. However, around 8500 BC, the climate began to change and there was significant rainfall in this area and the population began to disperse into areas outside of the Nile River Valley. And again, this is the time period that I believe that the Egyptian pyramids were in operation and producing chemicals. And there's several reasons for that. A, because there was significantly more water in the area during this time period. And again, that water was utilized to facilitate these chemical reactions. There was also large scale domestication of cattle in the upper Eastern Sahara during this time period. And again, we'll see that that cattle is essential to the chemical operations at the Set Pyramid of Saqqara, and we'll get to that here in just a moment. And I do believe that the climate change leading into the period surrounding the dynastic Egyptian civilization could be one of the factors that led the Egyptian pyramids falling into in operation. So there were a number of natural disasters that occurred around 5000 BC. And again, that climate change changing from an area that had significant rainfall into essentially a desert, could have either caused these pyramids to be damaged or to fall completely out of operation. And again, they were inherited by the dynastic Egyptian civilization as they began to repopulate this area around the Nile River circa 3500 BC, which is the beginning date of again that dynastic Egyptian civilization. All right, ladies and gentlemen, these are some exclusive photos and video of the harbor here and the Valley Temple at Saqqara. So just remember, this entire grassy area surrounding the temple would have been completely submerged in water. And this is the exact pathway that I mentioned in that quote that Brother Julius and Aquari use to enter the Valley Temple as they arrive into the harbor at Saqqara. So this next picture, this just shows what the remains of the temple look like today. Again, it was a glorious experience, an absolutely beautiful day, and not a lot of people get a chance to explore this site. And this is an exceptional, exclusive photo showing that harbor at the Valley Temple of Saqqara. So just remember that this entire area here would have been completely submerged in water. And the boats arriving into the Saqqara area would have docked here in this harbor. And after docking your boat, you could have walked up this partially submerged pathway leading from the harbor and into the Saqqara Valley Temple. So just remember, this is where it all began. It is that inundated water from the Nile River brought the excess water closer to the temple. That water was utilized to facilitate these chemical reactions inside of the structures. So this is a very critical component 
of the function of these pyramids. And I'm going to be inserting an exclusive video of this harbor area and of the Valley Temple here in just a moment. And this area, ladies and gentlemen, is the harbor of Saqqara. And this entire section here would have been submerged in water. And you can see here the pathway leading up from the harbor that was used to access the Valley Temple. And so you would walk down to your boat, docked here in the harbor, and the glory of the Saqqara Valley Temple. All right, and next up on our expedition in Saqqara was the Pyramid of Wanis or Unas. And you can see here the causeway that I mentioned in the previous slides that led from the Saqqara Valley Temple up to the pyramid complex itself. And you'll see here the causeway leads directly into the Eastern Temple outside of the reservoir. You'll see here the satellite pyramid enclosed within the reservoir itself. You have here another Eastern Temple on the side of the pyramid. And part of my theory is that these Eastern temples functioned one of two ways. They were either for processing of the raw materials that were utilized in the chemical reactions inside of the structure, or they were for collection of the product being created inside of the pyramid. And we'll get to that more in just a little bit. But again, just a quick review of the components. You have the causeway leading into the temple sections, your satellite pyramid here, the external reservoir surrounding the structure, and you can see here the inlet shaft leading into the primary reaction chamber inside of the pyramid. I'm going to have some exclusive photos and documentation from inside of this structure coming up here in just a moment. And here we go, walking up the causeway leading toward the Pyramid of Wanis. And you can see here the remains of two massive granite columns that would have formed the entryway to that eastern temple that I showed here in just a moment. And there's a number of things to keep in mind when evaluating the Pyramid of Wanis. So first of all, this structure was constructed after the building of the Great Pyramid. And this is according to the conventional timeline. And this is very, very important because the Pyramid of Wanis utilizes the exact same functional geology that was employed in the construction and operation of the Great Pyramid. So again, limestone, red granite, black basalt, and there are several other geological uh, compositions that are utilized here at this structure, and we're gonna show that here. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this picture may not look like much, but there is a lot of critical information contained within this photo that is relevant to the function of the Pyramid of Wunis. So one thing I wanna mention, one of the main questions that comes up here on the Land of Chem YouTube channel is why was there such a mass of stones that surrounded these reaction chambers? Well, just look here. The Pyramid of Wanis was a much smaller pyramid that did not have that massive body of stone surrounding the reaction chambers. And this is what it looks like today. It is essentially a crumbling pile of tiny pieces of stone, sand, and dust. Nothing basically remains. We cannot say the same about the pyramids of Dashur, the Red and Bent Pyramids, or the pyramids of Giza. These structures were built to last, and thankfully in Dashur and Giza, they built these pyramids with a huge body of stone that insulated these reaction chambers and protected them from degradation or destruction. And again, we cannot say the same with these small pyramids. There is very little that remains of the pyramid itself. However, thankfully to the construction itself, the integrity of the reaction chambers inside of this structure still remains, and you can still go inside of this pyramid. But one thing I wanted to look at, again, is this rubble field surrounding the pyramid on the eastern side. And there's a number of things to note here, particularly in regard to the geology utilized in the construction. So in this picture, you can see that there are large limestone slabs utilized in the foundation of this temple complex. However, there are numerous other types of geology that are integrated in the construction. You can see here, these are bases made from red granite, and there would have been massive columns here made of also red granite. You can also see that there are huge blocks of white calcite crystal, all integrated here into the foundation of this temple, and you can also see some massive pieces of red quartzite. And here in the next couple of pictures, these are just close-ups of those geological samples. So this is a sample of that white calcite crystal. 
This is one of the most compelling and interesting pieces of geology that is utilized in this site. This is a very, very unusual material. And every time I see this white calcite crystal, I can't help but imagine what it would have looked like in its pristine condition after these structures had been constructed. Again, cleaned, polished, just the original condition of these structures is absolutely amazing. And there's a reason for this white calcite crystal being utilized in the construction. And we'll get to that here in a little bit because I'm going to show some conduits that have been carved from that white calcite crystal. So this is another huge piece of red quartzite here incorporated in the foundation of the Eastern Temple. And in the next series of pictures, we're going to take a look at these conduit systems that have been carved into the white calcite crystal. So there have been several other channels that have evaluated these conduits and they imply that these conduits are utilized for drainage to remove water away from the structure. Okay, so that's an okay theory. However, I tend to disagree with that for several reasons. There are some sites that have conduits carved into limestone. However, those limestone conduits were also sheathed with copper piping, and we find that at Abu Ghraib and Abu Sir. Now, those limestone conduits could have been used for drainage away from the structure. However, I have conclusive evidence and what I would call proof that the conduits that were carved into uh, geology such as calcite or quartzite were not used for drainage. They were utilized for collection. So there's a couple of pictures here of these white calcite conduits. And in this previous picture, this conduit would have led all the way across here into this piece, which I'm going to show in the subsequent picture. So again, this is a piece of that conduit here carved into this white calcite crystal. A couple other pieces. So these are massive blocks of granite that are sitting on top of this white calcite crystal. Again, the layering of these geological types is critical to the function of these structures. And I'll be talking about that again later. Again, all of the geology is functional in regard to the operation. But again, you can see here the conduit carved into this white calcite block. And this is a close up of that conduit carved into this block of white calcite crystal. And in the next photo, I'm going to show you conclusive proof that these conduits were not used for draining water off of the site. They were utilized for collection. And here it is, ladies and gentlemen, an absolutely spectacular photo of the quartzite conduit and the quartzite collection bowl at Abu Sir. So a quick background on the configuration of the temple. So the pyramid is over here to the right. And this quartzite conduit runs from the pyramid underneath the black basalt floor of the adjacent temple. And the conduit spits out here into this red, red quartzite collection bowl. Now, my first question when I visited this site back in 2017 was collection for what? Of course, it was completely incompatible with all of the pharaonic burial theories that they'd be collecting any sort of liquid in these temples. So again, my theory is that the Egyptian pyramids were producing chemicals on an industrial scale. And again, these Eastern temples, as I mentioned before, were either for processing of raw materials or for collection of the product that was being created inside of the pyramid. And again, you can see here conclusive evidence that these conduits are not for drainage because if you were draining something, why would you then collect it? It is for collection of the chemical that was being produced at this site. All right, so the next part of our expedition was to journey inside of the Steppe Pyramid of Wenis. So this pyramid was not included in the first book in the series because this pyramid has just recently been opened to the public. I did have a chance to go inside of this pyramid during our November 2020 expedition last year, but this year I finally got a chance to do some research, get some documentation inside of this structure, and I finally have been able to come up with a work in progress theory for what this structure was doing and the chemical that it was producing. But in those previous photos, I showed the causeway leading here to the Eastern Temple, and that entire rubble field is the remains of this complex here that was adjacent to the pyramid itself. So the next series of photos, we're going to be going inside of the structure, showing the inlet shaft, the portcullis system, and of course, photos from inside of the primary reaction chamber. So here is that inlet shaft leading down into the primary reaction chamber of the Pyramid of Wenis. And this is a great picture from inside of that primary reaction chamber. Now, there's a number of things that I want to discuss about this structure, and I'll be doing that in a later video that focuses exclusively on this pyramid. But one thing I want to point out is the construction 
of this chamber itself and the geology utilized. So two thirds of this chamber is made from limestone blocks. However, the back third of this chamber is actually carved out of white calcite crystal. And I'll show, show you that here in just a moment in one of these subsequent pictures. And this is another very unusual detail that you can find inside of the primary reaction chamber of the Pyramid of Winnice. So if they turn all of the lights off inside of the pyramid, which they were very kind enough to do for us during this expedition, and you shine a flashlight on this wall, you can see here the reflection and shadow of what appears to be a figure. Now, I cannot say for sure if that was actually carved into the calcite wall, or if that is a part of the natural ripples that you find in the stone, which you can kind of see here. But again, it's a very unusual detail, and I just wanted to show you this because it's uh, pretty exciting to see this thing when they turn the lights off. And again, this figure just kind of pops out of nowhere where you can see it just from the shadow and reflection. And in this picture, you can see that white calcite crystal that was utilized in the back third of this primary reaction chamber. And this portion here is limestone. Now, as for the carvings here into the white calcite, these are very, very crudely, I would say, scratched into the surface of the white calcite. Now, I do believe that this structure was repurposed by the dynastic Egyptians, and there's clear evidence of a pharaonic burial inside this structure. This is one of the first pyramids where they found these pyramid texts, and it completely covers the walls of this chamber. However, those pyramid texts and the carvings inside the chamber are not original to the structure. And you can see here in this picture taken from behind this container that there are no hieroglyphs or carvings on this section of the wall. Now, what does that mean? That means that the wall and the container were here before the carving of these inscriptions. This picture shows a critical detail in regard to the operation of the Pyramid of Winnice. And I won't spoil it quite yet because I have a work in progress theory about what this structure was doing and how it was producing chemicals. However, I just want to point out that the ceiling of this primary reaction chamber does not meet the walls of the chamber. And this gap in between the two is essential in the operation of this structure. I'll also quickly point out these stars on the ceiling because I'm going to be discussing these at the very end of the video and I have some very very interesting research that I'm going to share with you guys at the tail end of this presentation but just keep in mind the configuration of these stars and we're going to be talking about that a little bit later. All right up next in our expedition to Saqqara was an exploration of the Step Pyramid complex and a journey inside of the newly opened southern quote-unquote tomb and of course we got a chance to go inside of the primary reaction chamber of the Step Pyramid and I'll be showing all of that here in just a moment. All right, at this point in the video, let's just do a quick recap of the Step Pyramid Complex so I can briefly review its original configuration, the stages of construction, exactly how the structure operated, and which chemical it was producing. So let's start with Step 1, the original configuration of the structure. So the components of the Step Pyramid were all excavated directly from the bedrock, and the three original components are the inlet shaft leading in from the north here, which goes directly into your primary digestion chamber. And there is an outlet shaft leading to the south. And that displacement shaft was utilized to remove the decomposed substrate material from the primary digestion chamber. And you can see here that this single level platform sealed the primary digestion chamber. And the gas that was being produced inside of this chamber was co collected directly out of the top of this platform. Now, as the demand for this gas increased, so did the scale of its production. And the step pyramid complex went through an evolution in construction. Um, originally, a four level platform was constructed on top of the single level platform. They eventually expanded the platform, which covered the original inlet shaft. And a new inlet shaft had to be dug that connected into this processing facility that was constructed here on the north side of the structure. And I've discussed this previously, that these temples adjacent to the pyramids were either processing faci facilities for the production of the raw materials that were utilized inside of the pyramid, or they were utilized for collection of the product that was being created inside of the structure. So you have here on the right, the configuration of a modern biogas digester. And you will notice it has the exact same components as the original step pyramid structure. You have here a mixing pit or a processing facility to create your raw material slurry. The slurry slides down the inlet shaft into the primary digestion chamber. And then that decomposed substrate material is collected from a displacement shaft that leads out of the primary digestion chamber. And that is exactly what we have here inside of the step pyramid. So my theory 
is that the Steppe Pyramid Complex of Saqqara was designed to produce methane gas from a slurry that was composed of water, agricultural scrap material, and cattle manure. And I'll get to the cattle manure here in just a second. But another thing to note are all of these tunnels that are excavated below the Steppe Pyramid Complex. And there's actually multiple layers of tunnels underneath this structure. And I believe that those tunnels were ex excavated later to tap into geological deposits of natural gas that were located here at this site. So again, this structure is very, very complex. It went through multiple stages of construction, reconstruction, and reconfiguration. So you have to keep that in mind when analyzing the current configuration of this structure. And I'll also get to discussing the large granite containers that are located inside of this primary digestion chamber and inside of that southern tomb, quote unquote, that I showed in the previous pictures, because those were not part of the original single level Mastaba platform or the original primary digestion chamber. Those were added later, and I think they're connected directly to the tunnel system that was excavated below the structure that again was utilized to tap into those natural deposits of methane gas. So let's again go back to the cattle manure. So cattle manure is essential to the production of methane gas because it contains anaerobic bacteria that digest the raw materials and create this methane gas. So if the cattle manure was essential to the production of this sacred gas, it would certainly make a lot of sense that this sacred material was incorporated in the symbols of that civilization. And you see here a picture of the scarab and a picture of the sacred cow or the sacred bull. So of course, in the land of Chem, I propose that the esoteric symbol of the dung rolling beetle is actually directly connected to the production of methane gas. So of course, in the dynastic Egyptian religion, the scarab is a symbol of resurrection, rebirth, and the rising sun. And that explanation never really resonated with me because at the end of the day, it is a dung rolling beetle. So however, if you were using cattle manure to produce this sacred, very valuable methane gas, what is the first step in the process of creating your, your slurry? Well, you got to collect the dung. And that is exactly what you see with the habits of the scarab, the dung rolling beetle. So again, my interpretation of this symbol is a more practical interpretation. And as with all great esoteric symbols, of course, there are multiple layers of interpretation. One that is intended for the consumption of the general public related to religious interpretations. But there are also deeper hidden meanings of these symbols that, in my opinion, are connected to the science of chemistry. The same being true with the deification of sacred cattle across the world in all of these ancient civilizations. So again, if cattle manure was essential to methane production, it would make a lot more sense that cattle became one of your most sacred deified animals. And that is exactly what we see in all of these ancient civilizations across the globe. Okay, so here in this diagram, I just wanted to present this because it is the most exceptional 3D representation of the Steppe Pyramid Complex, and it shows the southern displacement shaft that leads from the primary digestion chamber out towards the south. And this diagram was produced by the Latvian Scientific Mission in Saqqara in 2007, and they did LIDAR scanning of the entire area, and they discovered this displacement shaft that leads out of the primary digestion chamber. So that's just something to keep in mind regarding all of the Egyptian pyramids, that just because something is not listed on an old diagram, it does not mean it doesn't exist. And there are new discoveries being made with new technology at these locations every single day. And I can even testify that there is ongoing research at all of these pyramids, even here in 2021. And this is a great picture of that newly opened southern shaft system at the Steppe Pyramid of Saqqara. And I just wanted to show this immense red granite container located here in the center of this shaft system. Now, I've discussed this shaft system in my previous videos regarding the operation of the Steppe Pyramid, but this is my first chance to get a look at this red granite container. Now, if this was a container utilized for a pharaonic burial, why would it have a plug in the center of the container. And you can see here in this next picture that this plug was made to be removed. You could wrap a rope around this little groove here, removing this two piece stone plug and then sliding it back into place. So again, if this was a pharaonic burial sarcophagus, why would it need a removable stone plug? Well, the short answer is that it wouldn't. It was not a pharaonic burial sarcophagus and this is a functional part of this structure. 
All right, this is an awesome picture from inside of the primary digestion chamber of the step pyramid. And you can see here the original inlet shaft that leads into the primary digestion chamber. And again, another massive rectangular container here inside of the primary digestion chamber. And again, I believe that these were added later and are directly connected to the underground system of tunnels that were utilized to collect those geological deposits of methane. And you can see here as the same in the Southern tomb that there is a plug right here in the center of this container. Again, why would a pharaonic burial sarcophagus need a plug that could be removed? Well, it certainly wouldn't. This is a functional component of this container. And this is the modern day entrance to the structure, which was excavated by the Persians, possibly, not an original part of the structure. And we are getting here to the central chamber of the step pyramid. And again, this rectangular chamber was excavated directly from the bedrock. And here, dun dun dun. Look at that. 33 pieces, well, 32 rectangular pieces of red granite, and the 33rd piece being the plug. And this is your original inlet shaft. And of course, while we were at Saqqara, we did get a chance to go inside of the Serapeum. And this was my third visit inside of this structure. And I'm not gonna discuss too much about these boxes, but I just wanna make three quick points. First of all, these boxes are not precision machined. You can see here on the left, the clear curvature in the edges of this box. All of them are made from different materials. For the most part, all of them are unfinished. They are rough, they have protrusions, they have curvature. These are far from precision machined. Anybody that is telling you that is attempting to deceive you. I will say that I do not believe that these boxes or containers were created by the dynastic Egyptian civilization. You can see here on the right that the hieroglyphs that are scrawled into the surface of this container are incredibly crude and they barely scratch the surface of this container. And that is clear evidence to me that these were inherited by the dynastic Egyptian civilization. They came through and found these boxes, scrawled a bunch of hieroglyphs on top of them, and now these hieroglyphs are used to date and identify these boxes to a certain period within the dynastic Egyptian civilization. But again, they did not make these boxes. Another point that I'm going to make about the Serapeum, my first impression when I went inside this structure, so there's a lot of discussion about how they got these boxes inside of these tunnels because you can see here on the left there is little to no room on the edges of these tunnels to move these boxes around and i looked to see if there was any sort of housing in the walls that could have hold pulley mechanisms or something of that nature and none of that is inside of the serapium so i will say my impression of the serapium is that these boxes were not moved into this structure these boxes were buried in an artificial mound that covered them up and the tunnel system was excavated later to go back in and remove what was stored inside of these boxes. All right, and I just wanted to present these pictures of some of the vases that are in the Imhotep Museum at Saqqara, and I'm gonna make a couple of quick comments about this. So these vases are carved from calcite, and they are very, very crude. They are not precision, they are not even, and these could definitely have been made by the dynastic Egyptian civilization using the hand tools that they imply were used to make these things. And this is a picture of one of the descriptions here at the museum that shows this hand tool. It's a drill bit with a flint. And this is a little piece of flint down here at the bottom of this thing. And they're implying that these vases were carved out using this little flint tip. Okay, I am fine with that in regard to the crude vases that I showed you in the previous picture. However, there are artifacts like this inside the museum. And there is no way you can tell me that this artifact was carved using a primitive hand tool, like a hand drill that uses a piece of flint. This thing was made by a machine. Now, I wanna be very clear here when I say machine. I am not referring to lost ancient high technology. I am not referring to electricity powered machines. I am not referring to diamond tipped saws or any of this nonsense that is so prevalent across the internet regarding how these things were made. All I'm saying is that they had wooden apparatus 
machines that were utilized to make these type of artifacts. And for example, this is exactly what you see here in the Hierapolis saw. And I'm going to explain a little bit about how this thing works. So this is a Roman sawmill that was a water powered sawmill that was utilized to cut stone. So you he see here the water flowing, rotating your water mill here. The water mill spins these gears and the gear configuration moves the saws back and forth to cut these stones. Okay, so the dynastic Egyptian civilization and even the pre-dynastic civilization that built the pyramids, they understood how to work smarter and not harder. They were an ingenious civilization. These were master masons that understood how to cut and work stone. So the fact that the Romans had machines like this, the Romans got everything they knew from the Egyptian civilization. And this is what I believe the Egyptians were using to cut these stones. Again, this is not electricity powered machines. They are not diamond tipped power drills or anything of that nature. It is simple wooden machines that utilize physics and knowledge to create exceptional stonework. That brings me to these stars that I mentioned previously that we saw on the ceiling of the Pyramid of Winis. So let's just quickly review the configuration of these stars because that's going to be critical when we get to the next slide. So look here at the center of the star. There is a circle here in the center and you have your five points of the star all equally distributed and alternating or staggered. None of the points line up directly with the other point. So again, you have your circle here in the middle all of your five points equally distributed and they are alternating or staggered. So keep that in configuration in mind when we get to the next slide. So this we found outside of the step pyramid complex and I was ecstatic to find these pieces because I had seen pictures of them before. Now they recently did a renovation and cleaning of the step pyramid to prepare it for reopening to the public. And it's just now recently been reopened to go inside of this structure. And in the process of renovating the step pyramid, they moved tons and tons of white calcite crystal from the underground tunnels beneath the step pyramid. And they buried all of this in a huge rubble field to the north side of the step pyramid. And there's also tons of blocks that have been cleared out of the step pyramid that they have here just kind of strewn about outside of the pyramid. And I was ecstatic when I found these because again, I was familiar with these things and I just want to point out a couple of things. So remember the configuration of the stars in the previous slide. Well, let's look at the configuration of this thing, right? So you have here a circle in the center, but there's a big difference between the previous star. You also see a spoke here in the middle of the circle. And if you look at these blades, they are directly across from one another. There are five points here, but you have two blades here that are directly across from each other and two blades here that are directly across from each other. And this fifth thing is not a blade at all, but it goes straight down into the earth. And I'm going to show another picture of these stars so we can look. Okay. So this is the configuration of a star, right? So there's the circle in the middle, all four or five points equally distributed, and they are alternating or staggered. So these are are stars, ladies and gentlemen. These are not stars at all. So again, you can see here in the middle center, there is a circle, but there's also a spoke in the middle. So what does that imply? That this was a rotating mechanism. Again, look at these blades. These blades are not staggered or alternating. They are directly across from each other. See here on the left, these things are directly across from each other. And these, if you ask your licensed Egyptology guide, he's going to tell you that these are also stars, but that is complete nonsense, ladies and gentlemen. They are exactly what they appear to be. And I turn this picture up to that down so you can see how these things actually look. And I find it very curious that all of these blocks are broken off at the same place because it doesn't show you where this piece goes. Ladies and gentlemen, these are windmills or wind turbines. You can see here again, the, the circle in the middle with the spoke that implies that this is a rotating mechanism. And these are blades of your windmill that these things would have spun around the central spoke. And this piece would have gone into the ground at the very bottom. So again, this was an ingenious civilization that understood physics. They understood fluid dynamics. They understood air dynamics, and they have would have utilized all of these natural forces at their disposal for the production of stonework and again for the production of chemicals because that's an essential component of my theory is that they were masters of hydraulics and physics and those hydraulics and physics directly relate to the mechanisms that were producing these chemical reactions. So again, ladies and gentlemen, this is depicting exactly what it looks like. This is a windmill or a wind turbine. These are not stars. Now, 
My implication is that mechanisms like this could have been used to power sawmills or anything of this nature. So again, this was a civilization that has understood how to work smarter and not harder. And usually I don't cover this stuff, but I was really, really excited when I found those mills um, because again, the conventional explanation for those things that they are stars, but there is clearly a significant difference between what is depicted in an Egyptian star and those items that we found outside of the step pyramid. All right, for everyone that made it to this point in the video, I have something very, very special for you. I'm about to insert a clip, a very brief preview of an experiment that I conducted during this last trip to Egypt. I won't provide any discussion or explanation at this point, other than to say that this is by far the most important and exciting discovery that I have made. So, just a quick reminder that limited print copies of the Land of Chem book are now available. So if you want to help support the channel, just go to www.thelandofchem.com. You can pick up a t-shirt, buy a copy of the book. All of the recent orders and support of this channel mean more to me than words can possibly describe. So I will simply give you my most sincere thank you. So without further ado, I hope you enjoyed this little video. All right, ladies and gentlemen, here we are with our good friend Yusuf Awion at the Kemet shop today. Again, we're demonstrating the properties of some of the geology utilized in the construction of the Egyptian pyramids in proximity to the electromagnetic field being produced by this machine. And this is just a quick video to demonstrate the properties of the limestone. Again, you can see and hear the discharge and the reason this is occurring is because limestone does not provide any electromagnetic impedance. The electromagnetic energy is flowing directly through the limestone and producing a discharge into the copper wire. All right, everyone, that is it for today's video. This was episode 13, The Land of Chem 2021 Research Expedition Recap Part 1, covering the pyramids and structures of Saqqara. I have a plan for all of the subsequent videos to get all of my research expedition site visits out as soon as possible so that you can see all of that exclusive content and videos. And then we will resume with the regular content here on The Land of Chem, covering in depth the function and the product of these structures. So I really hope you enjoyed today's video. Just a quick reminder, if you haven't already, please subscribe to the Land of Chem YouTube channel. Click that notification bell so you get noticed when all the new videos come out. Again, I cannot say thank you enough to everyone that's recently subscribed to the channel. I think we're now officially up over 300 subscribers, which it may seem like a small number, but to me, it means everything. So thank you all so much for joining here on The Land of Chem. Of course, my website, www.thelandofchem.com. You can also follow me on Instagram, at The Land of Chem. I think that's it for today's video, so we will see you next time. <laughs>